Okay, this is chapter six, cognitive and physical development in middle childhood. And so uh, this diagram's a bit complex, so don't try to memorize this or anything like that. But this is a good, it's, it really illustrates some of the interactions here. So let's just look at some of those. Um, and the complexity of basically the major domains, which is the outer circles here. Uh, sentences and commands are actually related to cognition and thoughts and verbal behavior. Okay, uh, images on the left and thoughts uh, uh, basically have to do with the sensory system and how sensory input is labeled. And then uh, behavior uh, there on the right is obviously action and behavior. And, and then emotions are at the bottom feelings and drives. So you have emotions and drives. And these all have interactive effects. So you have uh, behavior and cognition interacting. Um, that is cognition uh, dictates behavior uh, when it becomes voluntary. So you think about and, uh, and then act. And so the frontal lobe is uh, act actually acting on the motor cortex to initiate behavior and then there's a complex system of coordinating it storing it with the cerebellum and the and the um uh, the gang uh, basal ganglia and so and then uh, you have emotions at the bottom um feelings and and drives and those interact with cognition and the way they interact with cognition has to do with executive function. So executive function, which we're going to, we'll talk about, uh, because that's really, executive function is one of the principal cognitive processes that make, uh, that uh, are a difference between young children and adults. But uh, what you have is uh, in executive function, you have intention and cognition eliciting control over emotions. And... Uh, the reason sentences and commands are in that category is because when sentences are, are logical um, expressions of cognition, then they tend to elicit control over emotion. When uh, verbalizations are a product of emotion, they tend to be non-logical and non-intentional. So that's when uh, someone's really angry and they start to verbalize and the verbalizations don't make a great deal of sense, then what's happening there is the limbic system is actually driving verbalization. Uh, so now, um, characteristics of toddlers and preschoolers are described by Piaget as egocentric, which means they only can perceive the world as they, uh, uh, from their own perspective, and they can't really perceive it from other people's perspective. So in a toddler's world, appearance is reality. There's no analysis or ability to think critically about causality and things like that. Also, another limitation that, that toddlers have because uh, they have um, limited executive function and all is the problem with reversibility. So they can't reverse operations very easily. And that's why they're kind of prone to get lost because, you know, they'll uh, be wandering a bit and then if uh, to, to find, the, find their way uh, requires them to retrace their steps, uh, they're pretty unable to do that. So, uh, and you can see that in some of their mental operations that, that they may have find it easier to add than subtract, uh, for example. And which is why actually when we start uh, teaching them arithmetic skills, we basically start with addition and then add, uh, subtraction is the reversal of that as soon as they start to uh, um, gain the ability to reverse operations. So what ends the concrete operations stage? This is Piaget's um, transition into latter mid middle childhood. And the process that ends the concrete operations stage and begins, uh, or excuse me, ends the pre-operational thought stage and begins the concrete operations stage is conservation. There's two videos here uh, on your playlist. One of them is labeled conservation of volume and one of them is labeled conservation of space. And these are two um, video examples of a preschooler uh, and his mom demonstrating his limitation with conservation of volume, conservation of space. This was actually created by one of my students who uh, and her 
child and is a very effective demonstration of these two principles. So what it means is, is that uh, young children uh, in the pre-operational thought stage have difficulty with um, understanding that uh, two concurrent processes can be going on at the same time. Like they can't hold one process uh, co constant and manipulate another, like a volume versus shape of a liquid or spacing versus numbers. They can't hold the numbers constant and mani manipulate space. So you can see that in, in uh, this um, uh, boy's uh, behavior. Also, so when they do transition out of the pre-operational thought stage and into the concrete operation stage, which is when they have mastered conservation and decentered to some degree, then uh, concrete in, in cognitive psychology means the opposite of abstract. So they can engage in some simple deductive reasoning. They have difficulty with inductive reasoning and they have pretty limited abstract reasoning. So what you can see in concrete operations kids, which is in preschoolers, that they may have some difficulty with things like um, hyperbole, um, examples uh, and uh, uh, things that require some kind of abstract reasoning. Uh, inductive reasoning is, is pretty difficult for them. So they take the world as a result at face value. Um, they take verbalizations pretty much at face value, which means that they can misinterpret context. Uh, and um, so sarcasm doesn't really work on at the, on, on this, uh, in this age group. What's going to end the concrete operation stage is the onset of abstract reasoning, which is actually inductive reasoning, going from specific to general, applying things in novel ways. This usually coincides with right before the beginning of adolescence, or what Freud called the, the latency age. These days we can see it in third graders, for example, um, the reason that teaching third grade is actually a lot of fun is because those kids have a pretty uh, advanced ability to understand humor and to understand examples and, um, and to apply things in novel ways. Uh, their deductive reasoning, that is their hypothesis testing improves, that is hypothesis testing is the predicting, predicting of an outcome after an action, so you make a prediction and then you sort of experiment, and then you uh, test to see if your prediction uh, comes true. That's um, hypo hypothetical type thinking. And they're, so they're, they're, um, their cognition becomes much more flexible, rational. Uh, they can follow systematic steps, and uh, they can look at problems from variable, from various uh, angles. And they can understand other people's point of view better. So empathy gets better, uh, and their ability to uh, engage in um, impression management, you know, try to um, influence somebody in a certain way uh, gets better. And that's actually a measure of how progressed they are because the better their skills at impression management and understanding the perspective of others gets, the more functional they are and the, and the better uh, social relationships they can have. You may notice that adolescents develop an interest in music, um, arts, uh, and uh, stories. Um, if they've been readers up till then, they uh, actually, uh, if you can get them into reading fiction, they become pretty avid readers which can really help them ac academically later on if they become, uh, if they develop habits of reading for entertainment. Uh, again, inductive reasoning is the process of uh, using examples and uh, going from specific to general to think of novel ways of applying certain concepts. So um, you, when you can start to predict the, the sort of next step out of a pattern, uh, that's inductive. And um, so now when they uh, improve in their deductive reasoning, uh, this is uh, when they can engage in scientific or empirical type thing. They become much better critical thinkers. So uh, that's the foundation for 
critical thinking is deductive reasoning. These are basically if-then statements. If, if A is true, then B must be true. Let's go back to memory again. We keep returning to the Axe and Schiffer model of memory because the PJ and stages are, actually have dramatic implications for memory. So the, the part to focus on here is elaboration. Adolescents uh, develop a significant ability to elaborate to form retrieval cues. So that's why their aptitudes for storing information are getting close to their peak. It'll peak out in early adulthood, but it's very close to their peak. So what that means is, is that, that it's an opportunity there in, with, for the years that they're in adolescence. It's an opportunity for them to store uh, and build a significant knowledge base. The reason they can do that is because, one, they're going to be able to engage in systematic hypothesis type testing, uh, and, uh, un, and that, that helps them elaborate and gain a deeper understanding of certain objective concepts. They also uh, have sort of an explosion in semantic memory, which is the storage of facts, as long as they're exposed to situations where they're encouraged to or required to store facts. So this is what I call an opportunity cost. If you have a, a time period here when aptitudes are so high and a deficit in opportunity, then you can see a loss of opportunity to gain a significant knowledge base while they are in adolescence and early adulthood. And that happens sometimes with uh, kids that are in sort of uh, environments that are sort of impoverished when it comes to education and educational opportunities and experiences. It's also kind of an indictment of some um, school systems where they work them pretty hard up until about fifth or sixth grade. And then there tends to be this, this slacking off that goes on uh, through junior high. And then by the time they get to high school, the requirements are significantly less for the, say, uh, lower functioning kids or the kids that are not so heavily engaged. They're not the ones in, in lots of extracurricular activities or they're not really interested in academics in their classes. They're not, they don't read a lot. And the problem there is, is that uh, if the school responds by having lots of extra credit, non-graded credit, um, classes that don't have lectures and just worksheet training. And, uh, you know, in a senior year, which is getting close to their absolute peak in aptitude, if the senior year is uh, the only requirements to go to class for a day and work in the office for, um, for an hour and work in the office for an hour, and then you can go to your minimum wage job for the rest of the day, the problem there is that there's a lot of downtime and a lot of missing of that opportunity to gain a significant knowledge base. And that's going to have long-term effects. So um, that's why uh, there really needs to be some re-examination of the way we plan the scope of education all the way through the senior year. Because what you can see is if you look at private schools or, or the, uh, the honor students, the merit scholars and the kids that are really really engaged uh, in, the, in the public schools and in the private schools, the high need achievers, they are building an enormous uh, knowledge and experience base through that senior year all the way into early adulthood and entering the next sort of learning phase, whether it's college or something like that. Uh, when they enter that learning phase, they've already got uh, quite a bit accumulated. So they've got something to rely on. They've got a schematic network built up, places to store information. So um, that can make a big difference. So there's a significant relationship between cognitive skills and executive function. We've already talked about executive function as being the cognitive elicitation of control over emotion. Um, but this also has a pretty dramatic effect on knowledge accumulation and uh, functionality in that, and you know, success. Uh, and that is the ability to cognitively self-regulate. That is, uh, tone down emotional impulses, and uh, they uh, can avoid the kind of procrastination that's common, distraction, uh, and uh, elicit control over uh, emotion and impulses uh, for more of a goal-directed kind of uh, way of, of um dealing with their peers in school and, and things like that. Uh, so 
Uh, executive function can also have effects on their safety because adolescents are prone to be risk takers, some of them, um, because they underestimate uh, the um, consequences of certain actions and their impulses can fail them in that regard because they, if they don't have real good impulse control, then they can act in a way that's not safe. Let's look at metacognition. Metacognition is thinking about thinking. That's when uh, an adolescent is trying to come up with a strategy to solve a problem and they're actually acutely aware of the strategy. Metacognition is when you're trying to retrieve a piece of information and you're acutely aware uh, that, you, you, that, that the answer is there and you have a little difficulty finding it. So there's, there's really two concepts here. There's metacognition and metamemory. Metacognition is the experience of, of, of knowing that you're thinking or on purpose forming a strategy for solving a problem or thinking about something or on purpose changing how you think about something to uh, change an emotion. And metacognition is that sense of, of familiarity that you know that you should remember this, like someone's name or you're telling somebody about something and there's a word that just won't come to mind, but you have that sense that it's there. Or when you see a face and it looks familiar, but you don't remember who they are, that's meta memory telling you who they are. So metacognition sort of lays the, found, lays the foundation for cognitive self-awareness. And cognitive self-awareness is our self-monitoring process. That's how am I doing this or am I progressing towards my goal and making assessments along the way and adjustments. So cognitive self um, awareness or metacognition is related to cognitive uh, self-regulation. Like if you're consciously aware that you have an impulse and then you elicit control over that impulse on purpose, then that is metacognition leaving, leading to meta, uh, meta, <laughs> cognitive self-awareness. Now, cognition leads us to a discussion of intelligence. Intelligence is, of course, how smart you are. And uh, it's operationalized. Uh, to, to form an operational definition means to define it in measurable terms. So how do we measure intelligence? Well, first we operationalize it as the score on some kind of a test. And uh, intelligence tests are um, psychometric tests that measure a person's ability to think and problem solve and speed of retrieval and speed of uh, problem solving uh, in uh, which is your mental power measure, and that uh, determines what your overall intelligence is, is. Now, the whole idea of intelligence and intelligence testing started with uh, Spearman's G, which is uh, the idea that you could, you could get a general measure of intelligence, that you could do it with a single score. And uh, in contrast to uh, other models that look at intelligence as having components or varying skills. Uh, so this led to a, a debate in the literature, but it starts with the development of the first test based on Spearman's G or general intelligence, which was the IQ test. Um, and, and then as soon as the IQ test was developed, then multiple intelligences uh, theory uh, came out and started to actually compete with the idea of general intelligence because people thought that that uh, general intelligence score didn't really lay out the picture. It didn't give a good picture of what intelligence is. So Spearman's G uh, combines several um, factors here. Charles Spearman uh, combined numerical, which is arithmetic ability, spatial, reasoning, mechanical, uh, which is mostly procedural mem uh, uh, processes and verbal or semantic processes together and all those make up the G-score which is the Spearman's G. So it operates from the assumption that you can collapse all of these things into a single score. To measure based on Spearman's G, Lewis Terman uh, had noticed that Alfred Binet in uh, Paris, France, uh, had he found this in the literature where Alfred Binet was a psychometrician in France and he had been hired to come up with a achievement test for kids 
in the Paris schools because they were worried that some kids, they were not detecting the kids that really needed help academically. So um, what Binet did was he used what's called the normative approach to develop a, an achievement test. Uh, the normative approach was an approach developed by Arnold Gessel and uh, that, and what it really was was just any time you establish some kind of norms with which you can compare people. So what Binet did was he gave samples of this uh, overall kind of final exam that had all the academic skills in it and he, to samples of kids at different grade levels. So first graders, second graders, third graders, all the way up through the last grade of school. And then he calculated a mean score for those and the uh, variance of them to set up a curve uh, for each group. And that gave him the norm. So this is the score that, say for example, the average first grader should score on this. And then here's the score that the average second grader would score. And of course it would be higher. And then the third grader and the fourth grader and the score would go up as you went through all the grade levels. And then he took that those, those norms and uh, he developed the process of you, you of the school applying that same test to a kid that might need help. They notice that a child has a problem, you know, and they're not doing well in school. Well, they would give them the uh, Binet test of achievement, and then they would compare that kid's score with other kids in their age group. And if they were a couple of years behind those kids, then they would get them special help. So Lewis Terman at Stanford University found this test and was interested in measuring uh, in, uh, intelligence, which is not achievement, it's aptitude. So he thought he would use some strategy similar to that to measure aptitude. Aptitude is the ability to learn. And him, he, uh, so he and a colleague, uh, William Stern, uh, came up with uh, skills tests that were timed that they could administer. And then based on the child's age, they could calculate uh, a quotient, and this would be called the intelligence quotient. And a, uh, the, the formula for an intelligence quotient is mental age, which is the age of the kid, over chrono I mean, uh, which is their test score, over chronological age, which is the age of the kid, times 100. And uh, so mathematically, the way it works out is if their mental age is equal to their chronological age and you multiply it times 100, then that's 1 over 1 times 100, which gives you an average IQ of 100. So uh, Stern, uh, William Stern set that up like that because he wanted to be able to look at the score across kids, so uh, across all subjects. And so the average would always be 100. So that would give you a way of cross comparing people to subjects. So then the Stanford, uh, uh, Binet named the, t I mean, uh, Lewis Terman named the test the Stanford Binet and they published it. And now it's one of the, even today, it's it's been modified some, but it's one of the, commonly used uh, IQ tests. There are several others. Well, as happens in almost any scientific discipline, once you come up with a theory, you come up with a potential for debate. And debate between theorists is what drives the theory. And sure enough, uh, when intelligence testing came up and uh, the Spearman's G concept was tested and the IQ test was developed, you start to see a debate emerged in the literature, and that's uh, the debate between Spearman's G as a measure, a general measure of, measure of intelligence, collapsing all the variables into one score, and people that uh, wanted to look at intelligence from a multi-score or multiple, but from the perspective of multiple intelligences, so that you could kind of determine how smart somebody is by looking at what their particular version or qualitative type of intelligence is, and so. One of the first people to do this was Robert Sternberg. And Sternberg, I heard him speak at an APA conference when I was a graduate student. He was at the time running for the president of the APA. He gave a really interesting talk. He talked about how when he was a child, he was tested with an, a regular achievement test in school and he tested below average. And so they put him in to a special ed class where he spent a, another couple of years in his elementary school. And then when they tested him again, later on when he was in adolescence, he tested above average. So they moved him into 
the regular classroom, and then he wound up in gifted and talented, and he graduated uh, pretty high in his class, and he wound up, you know, going to uh, uh, on to, to get a PhD, and he's become a preeminent theorist in psychology, um, and so. Sternberg's uh, takeaway from that was is that the, the overall idea of collapsing these variables together was not really a good way of looking at intelligence. So he created a model called the Triarchic Theory of Intelligence, where he, he takes those collapsed domains and he separates them out into three intelligences. Analytic ability, which is cognition, ability to solve problems, and raw intelligence, like an IQ test, favors mostly. Creative intelligence, which is more inductive reasoning and in and uh, the ability to, to um, think creatively. Uh, IQ tests don't measure that very well. And then practical intelligence, which Sternberg included, which is the ability to apply your intellectual um, horsepower there to basic life decisions, people that just function very well uh, and uh, make uh, really good decisions. Uh, and the, he, um, so he included that, and IQ tests don't measure that at all. So uh, Sternberg uh, and points this out that that there are these three domains. And what's interesting is is that uh, you can see people that function extremely well at the analytical uh, level. Uh, they may even be very creative as well, but don't function well in the practical um, intelligence. And so they may be impulsive, disorganized. Uh, they may procrastinate, but they don't actually get their their uh, academic or, or intellectual abilities don't come to fruition. Just like uh, somebody that has a strong predisposition to be a musician or an athlete, but just never gets around to it. So uh, you can also see people that are um, really cognitive and really practical, but not very creative. They have difficulty with abstract concepts, with making connections. So uh, this gives you more of a qualitative view of intelligence. Another theorist that even gets us more deep into this was Howard Gardner. And Gardner took the uh, idea of, of multiple intelligences and created many more domains. So he talks about uh, some of the abilities that you can see, which include uh, linguistic, mathematical, uh, which are highly favored on an IQ test. And then a lot of skills that are not favored on an IQ test at all, like musical ability, um, intra and interpersonal skills uh, and uh, kinesthetic abilities only to a, a sm um, limited extent on an IQ test. So a dancer, for example, may have a, or an athlete may have a great deal of skill and, pre and um, predisposition for being able to, to, to uh, uh, be proficient at body tasks, kinesthetic tasks, balance, reaction time, uh, things like that. Um, and then musical abilities uh, are uh, having a real good pitch sense, um, you know, the ability to um, uh, hear harmonies and, uh, and create music. Um, and so, you know, you see visual and artists, um, some people are real mathematical and logical. And by the way, these are not mutually exclusive. So that, and we run that with a bit of a myth that athletes can't be smart people or good at math and uh, musicians can't be, um, you know, naturalistic or, or logical. And uh, there's actually not much evidence to that. Some people are socialized that way, but uh, the brain doesn't work that way. You, you don't, it isn't, a bunch of uh, opponent processes in there where if you're really creative, you can't be really athletic. In fact, athletes and musicians tend to be in the top of the class, and it's not unusual at all for uh, merit scholars and you know highly intelligent people to also be highly athletic and um, or, or highly creative and artistic and musical. Engineers sometimes are very creative. In fact, the best engineers are very creative. Another issue that came up about the time intelligence testing uh, began to be used uh, broadly was uh, inherent cultural biases and how the tests were constructed. The um, was discovered that 
and claims were being made by Arthur Jensen and others that certain some uh, ethnic groups uh, or racial groups were actually um, intellectually inferior to other ethnic groups, or that that, that white European descendants were um, biologically superior when it came to intelligence to other groups. And uh, so uh, when they made those claims, the um, considering that race is not biological, it's much more cultural, uh, that didn't make sense to some people. So some statisticians and testers began to look at the nature of the tests and they discovered pretty quickly that actually the tests had an inherent bias, that the context of some of the words, some of the tasks in the testing, and this included standardized tests, uh, that, that they favored white, Europe, white people of European descent over people from other ethnic groups. So uh, they did some interesting experiments. Uh, they would change the, some of the semantics on the test to actually favor the minority group, readminister the test to a sample of whites and a sample of minorities and found they could actually flip the results the other way. And the uh, minority kids would actually outscore the white kids. They also um, were falsely attributing uh, the score differences exclusively to race. And actually when they got to an analyzing the samples, it wasn't long before the statisticians discovered that the difference was actually social class. And if you took a, a group of white kids of European descent in the upper class or upper middle class and uh, a sample of white kids of European descent in the lower income brackets, and you gave them IQ tests and compared them, you would see the same gap. So when they eliminated social class, you compare middle class um, ethnic minorities to middle class whites or upper middle class ethnic minorities to upper middle class whites or lower income. If you, if you control for uh, social class, the difference goes away. Now, when we look at kids getting into adolescence, uh, transitioning from concrete operations to formal operations, you're looking at kids that are getting much more social and they're seeing themselves much more in the context of the people around them. They've also decentered some, so they're looking at perspectives, like how do people see me? And what's the difference between me and other people when it comes to things like social status? Uh, and this is when you can start to see the effects of stereotypes. So a stereotype is a ambiguous attributional kind of process where you take some uh, idea and either create a false narrative about it or you expand it beyond reason and create a exaggeration of some trait. Um, and people um, can react to stereotypes by, or by it, it, a person that holds biases, stereotypical biases, you know, racism, sexism, things like that. So like a stereotype of females, you know, is that they can't do math or they shouldn't be bosses. Uh, stereotypes of males that they're uh, violent, uh, you know, that all males are violent. So anytime you over categorize, now are males more aggressive than females? Yes. Are all males aggressive? No. So uh, all males are aggressive would be a stereotype. Um, and all females are non-aggressive would be also be a stereotype. So uh, that's stereotyping. And stereotypes are ambiguous. They don't have roots in anything um, empirical. Um, so, uh, and they result sometimes in the self-filling prophecy, which is something that uh, some researchers named Rosenthal and Jacobson came up with. Um, years ago. Uh, but the self-fulfilling prophecy is when you believe something to be true and your belief in, in it uh, causes you to behave in a way that actually increases the probability that it will be true. So for example, you believe some stereotype about somebody and then you treat them in a certain way and then their behavior justifies or validates your treatment. So that uh, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So uh, for example, if uh, if somebody has expectations about somebody and then they act on them based on those expectations, that person may actually begin to behave in ways that validate the expectation. Um, 
people can also place themselves in stereotypical positions. That, that's what happens when somebody grows up in a neighborhood and they're socialized to believe they're inferior to people outside their neighborhood. That's actually a really common problem in low-income neighborhoods, that a sense of uh, because I'm, I live in this neighborhood, I'm inherently deficient in these certain areas, and there's no real evidence for that, but it can be a... a uh, a person's exaggeration of their own limitations based on where they live or what kind of family they're in or their own ethnic uh, um, group. So the stereotype threat is when someone's aware that the people around them or people that have more power than them may uh, place them in one of these involuntary categories and act on them in a discriminative way um, with, their, with prejudices against them. And then what that can do is that can create a certain amount of anxiety in that person, and it can have an, a, a, an effect on their performance. The stereotype threat can become a cycle where you have the stereotype threat, the self, the self-fulfilling prophecy, and then uh, it it's, becomes a self-fulfilling uh, cycle. Um, so, and uh, you know, we can see this with. Uh, the problem we're having right now with how police respond to ethnic minorities in the community, and we could make the assumption that they're going out there with uh, uh, their own biases that they're completely aware of, but we'd probably we'd be more accurate if we assumed that they were going out there with some biases that they weren't entirely in touch with or aware of at the time, and they're acting on ways that confirm that, bi that bias. Um, sometimes this is at a, at a person's level of awareness, sometimes it's not. Uh, and so a uh, classic example is, you know, a, a uh, um, African-American is driving a car going down the street in a, you know, integrated neighborhood or an all-white neighborhood and a police officer is driving along and they, the kid sees the police officer and his, and his experiences are that he feels at risk for that police officer to pay attention to him, pull him over, he may have been pulled over before, uh, that uh, he's, because of his race and where he is, that that officer may pay attention to him, which causes him to look over at the police officer, okay? The police officer's driving along and in fact does notice the kid in the car, but he sees that the look on his face and the way he's looking at him, uh, he starts to form the assumption that, that he's up to something. So I'm gonna pull that kid over. He looks like he's up to something. So then it's the traffic stop that's about, you know, I need to check your, you know, your uh, inspection sticker or insurance or your license plate lights out or something like that. And then it's the 20 minutes sitting on the curb waiting for the police officer to go through and check everything and ask him to look in their trunk and uh, all this kind of stuff. And, and this is a common kind of cycle that ethnic minorities often go through with the police. And, uh, and so what you've got there is that kind of stereotype threat, the anx anxious reaction to the threat, that anxious reaction getting the attention of the officer, the officer acting on uh, their own biases, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then, you know, over and over again until uh, everyone's confirming their own uh, until uh, the, the bias is confirmed and the anxiety is confirmed and it just continues. So, and the same thing can happen with teachers, you know, teachers can have an expectation based on a kid's social class, their uh, sex, their race. Uh, they can have expectations about that kid uh, and what, uh, you know, what their potential is academically. And kids can pick up very subtle signs uh, if there's an expectation that they're going to fail, they're more likely to fail. If there's an expectation that they're going to succeed, they're more likely to succeed. Now, that's something that Rosenthal and Jacobson demonstrated in their experiment. And when we talk about gifted children, we're not just talking about cognitive gifts, although most of them will have exceptional cognitive gifts. But gifted children are, are ones that have... Um, sort of an extraordinary ability to engage in certain complex tasks, uh, higher levels of creativity, higher levels of athletic, athleticism, 
and the ability to delay gratification, which is required to be a really good athlete or a really good musician, uh, high need achievers, which means that um, they are highly reinforced by accomplishment. Uh, they may have exceptional abilities to think in novel ways and be real creative. Uh, and they tend to have just higher uh, behavioral drives. Now, intellectual disabilities can come from a variety of causes. So on the left here, you can see the uh, causes, uh, probably the most significant from uh, um, the ones that are a little more fluid. And uh, that is, is genetic predispositions or physical factors like fragile X syndrome, Down syndrome, uh, phenylketonuria, undetected, untreated. And then there's uh, birth trauma and prenatal problems in mom or baby. So you can have maternal infections, uh, toxemia in the mother, early childbirth, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome or, or other drugs that mom's taken, and certain birth defects that just happen, you know, during the gestation and the formation of the fetus. And then you can have uh, childhood injuries like uh, that come from illness uh, or accidents. So meningitis, encephalitis, uh, and uh, injuries that are the result of maltreatment, uh, falls, unsafe conditions, uh, lead in the water. Uh, there's all kinds of things like that that can cause injuries in kids. The earlier they are, generally the worse they are. So um, very early in life, case of, of um, measles, meningitis, uh, mumps, rubella. Uh, that's why um, right now the issue of not vaccinating has come up as a real problem because um, people often don't realize that a case of measles can leave, leave someone deaf or blind. Uh, and we're seeing a resurgence of measles and we had it almost completely wiped out. Uh, so uh, that's, that's an issue on the table right now. Uh, it may also be an issue with the COVID-19 virus because we don't know what the long-term effects are. They sort of jumped the gun and said that, well, kids get only a light case, if any case at all, and they don't tend to be susceptible to this. Uh, there's actually, that contradicts just basic biology and medical evidence because we don't know what kind of long-term effects they'll be. This is a vascular disease, and uh, there's every possibility that someone that's had COVID-19 or exposure to it very early in childhood could wind up susceptible to uh, inflammation in the lungs and the heart later on in life. We just don't know. Um, and then there's environmental factors like neglect, malnutrition um, that are, you know, not necessarily based on any predisposition or biology, but just uh, they did, they were malnourished during a critical time like zero to five years old and then afterwards they didn't get adequate nourishment until afterwards if they did at all and uh, that's common in third world countries um, so that's an issue and then you can rank intellectual disabilities from mild moderate severe to profound and of course the most common are mild um, and these are the ones with uh, learning disabilities and um, just mild limits in IQ um, and the least least common. One of the things to keep in mind is, is that a person can have a high level of intellectual capability but have a learning disability or learning disabilities. So um, learning disabilities can appear as intellectual deficits, but they are not necessarily intellectual deficits. Uh, for example, um, when kids have dyslexia, that's a reading disability, uh, it's actually uh, the inability to track with your vision from one side to another in written text or in numbers to reverse numbers and all. And it's a, actually a visual motor problem uh, that when a person is dyslexic, they don't know they're dyslexic. They just and they, early in cases of dyslexia, most kids don't understand why they can't uh, get things from reading, get information from reading the way the other kids can. They don't understand that because they don't have a sense that they can't read. They just don't get anything out of it when they do. And that's because the too much of their efforts uh, on trying to actually read the words 
And, uh, you know, when you become a reader, you actually, after a while, you, you immerse yourself in what, what the, the text is saying. Like, you know, it's kind of like I describe it. When, when a person that's a reader reads a, a novel, uh, that it plays in their head like a video. You don't, you're not actually consciously aware you're reading the words. A person with dyslexia may always be really consciously aware that they're struggling with the words. Um, and so, and then you have people that have difficulty with um, arithmetic functions and mathematics. Uh, a lot of that's anxiety, math anxiety, because actually the brain does mathematics pretty well. Uh, but um, we're taught from a very early age to fear math. Uh, some people are, and uh, so they'll hear phrases like, well, it's not rocket science and stuff like that. Like, you know, you'd never hear anybody say, well, it's not concert violin, or it's not playing quarterback in the NFL. I mean, it's, it's always, it's not rocket science or it's not calculus, you know? I mean, so we frame it in a way that makes math sound hard and other things are not hard. And, and uh, that's a social kind of thing that goes on with how we categorize things. Uh, so you can have dysfunctions of language processing, uh, phonological awareness, visual processing, perceptual motor integration, processing speed, memory and attention, and executive functions. And most of those things are tested on an IQ test. That's why one of the tests you give when you're testing for disabilities is specific problems and then general intelligence. Now, ADHD is a common uh, condition you find. Uh, usually you, you see it first in kids, but some people don't get diagnosed with ADHD until much later in life. But generally what it is, it's an attention deficit. The, pro, the, the, the ability to hold your attention on a single uh, concept long enough to get it into working memory is impaired in many people with ADHD. Now, uh, ADHD um, includes the inability to uh, ignore distractions. So uh, some people have ADHD because they can't ignore distraction. Peripheral stimuli, oh, you know, get in the way and block their ability to focus their attention. Other people have ADHD because they uh, are they have poor impulse control, so they can't delay gratification. Uh, and and uh, and then some people have ADHD because they have a short attention span. They can't hold on to maintenance rehearsal long enough to get information encoded into the brain. And um, so it's actually a developmental it causes developmental delays in kids sometimes, and it can be misdiagnosed as uh, severe behavioral problems. Uh, when kids are kind of rowdy and distracted, then uh, they may get in trouble a lot. Uh, also, it's common for people to grow up with ADHD, and by the time they get to adolescence, they have a pretty significant inferiority complex because uh, they just think that they're not smart and they may not completely understand why, um, you know, they're always uh, kind of on people's bad side. You know, they get corrected a lot and things like that. So uh, I've seen adults with ADHD get their first uh, treatment for it and uh, tell me that it's like somebody cleared up the world for them. They could see, they could hear, they could think. Uh, and those were people that actually got on some kind of medication as adults for ADHD. Um, the medicines for ADHD are generally uh, frontal lobe stimulants. Uh, caffeine's a frontal lobe stimulant. It generally helps people with ADHD. In fact, uh, I know a pediatrician used to recommend to uh, parents of school-age kids, you know, adolescents and ones in middle school, that if they had ADHD to try, you know, giving them a, a, a little a bit of coffee in the morning and um, see if that didn't give them a better morning at school. So the diagnosis of ADHD, you see certain um, behaviors, inattention and procrastination, uh, poor impulse control, fits of anger. Usually that's frustration uh, because uh, ADHD kids are subject to sensory overload. There's just too much information coming in. They're too distractible. They have a low threshold for stimuli, and so they have difficulty ignoring. 
Uh, they're not always hyperactive, but they can appear so because they're distracted. And then just poor long-term memory encoding, and uh, so they have difficulty with learning. 